Hi, this is Paul, and I want to keep working on the Brett Weinstein's Dark Horse podcast with Sam Harris and some of the issues that that raises. Um, let's get into it a little bit, and we're going to get into another podcast that Brett had done with a character named Jim Rupp that I didn't know anything about, but Brett mentions it in this podcast, so let's listen to some of this. psychological discovery whether or not freedom is real right he's like you're you're this is this is the end of the free will conversation with sam and then they're going to start migrating over into the question of religion and what is religion and as as brett says in terms of how they were seated at the jordan peterson event with sam harris you you have sam harris basically saying religion is you know Religion is this thing that needs to go away. Brett Weinstein saying, well, kind of in the middle. And Jordan Peterson saying things like, we lose the Bible at our peril. You're pushing, you're, you're in the woods and you don't know what's in there with you and you're exploring, right? That is a psychologically a thrilling and scary and beautiful experience and it doesn't matter if it's a screensaver. Well, I, I, get, I think I understand what you're saying, but here's what I feel like it implies. I feel like you and actually other people who I've encountered who have made a, uh, an argument for full determinism, I feel like the model is that the world is fully deterministic up to the border of psychology and that you're actually able to observe and of course, everybody who would make an argument. Now, now again, if you go to the last video where I was treating this, talked about the manifest vision and the scientific vision. And so the world is fully deterministic up until the point of psychology. And that's where sort of we bump into the manifest image. And so you've got these two, you've got these two competing visions going on. Argument in favor of full determinism understands that there's nothing in observation that is absent from the full deterministic model. But I feel like the things that you say relative to meaning observation doesn't matter if it's a screensaver because it's still beautiful and fascinating to you that all of that more or less assumes a mind that is independent of complete determinism trapped in a world that is completely deterministic so that and in other words the you sort of have the mind over here in the woods experiencing either the terror or the thrill or whatever, and then you've got the world. And, and so in a sense, you have a dualism where you have two separate things going on. And of course, for Brett, who's made a career talking about how evolution impacts us psychologically, impacts our behavior, impacts us emotionally, the world out here and the emotional world are deeply connected. Again, this is Jordan Peterson's point about lobsters. It is ironically Sam Harris's point about, well, if we'd only get rid of religion and use rationality, then we could all be happy. And, and Sam basically reflects the um, sort of materialistic American posture, which is that internal happiness is a product of external circumstance. And of course, the meaning crisis is in some ways exhibit one that that might not be so easily so because here in the meaning crisis you have people for whom uh, the world should be dandy for them we have read Steven Pinker's book we have more resources things are better and better and better so then why are we more and more anxious if if psychological well-being and happiness is simply a product of um, having all of our material concerns addressed then we should be happier than anyone. And in past videos, I've used the example of a an alligator that I saw in this alligator farm in Florida where I walk in and there's all these alligators sitting in warm pools of water and the guy goes out there and throws chicken at them. And I said, you know, don't these alligators get bored? I said, no, their minds are really tiny. They just, if, if the weather is, if the water is warm, if someone's throwing chicken at them, those alligators are perfectly happy. Well, then you have to ask, well, what's wrong with us? So supposedly these, these big brains and all this rationality should produce um, greater 
control over the environment such that we can produce happiness for ourselves. And all of Jordan Peterson's illustrations about Dostoevsky and piano keys, um, you know, doesn't make any sense that, that we as human beings, if we have plenty of food and security and all of these nice things should be just as happy as those alligators in the warm ponds of the alligator farm, but we're not. And so therefore you have a problem of evidence. And so right now Brett is saying to Sam, Sam is saying, oh, well, in the woods, you can be happy and exciting and thrilling, even though everything is just marching on materialistically. And, and Brett says, now, wait a minute, there's a connection between these two worlds. Where is that connection? The, the human being, it has no meaningful ability to deviate anything, but it's still functioning in a way that you can appreciate. It. Whereas I would say, the word appreciate has zero meaning. You know, does... well, well, no, the, the, the no, the, the appreciation is still mere mechanism in mere this mechanism. picture, but it feels a certain way, right? So, and like I didn't, I didn't author my preference for beauty over ugliness, right? But finding that I have one becomes actionable. Right again, and to the degree to which I'm moved by it, or if it flips tomorrow, is again something I can't account for. But there's still this experience of being suddenly presented with something that you didn't see a moment ago, and finding it beautiful. And there's no place you don't have to justify that. From you don't have to stand outside of that mechanism to justify it, to make it actionable. You just it's just. It's just there, right? It's just a lock and key that that you keep, you know, marrying and twisting again and again, and they change, but right? In this picture, you're describing a circumstance in which the mechanism is acting through means that are utterly bizarre if they don't mean what they appear to me. So the fact that I am speaking to you by vibrating the air molecules between us in such a way that they vibrate a membrane in the side of your head, which then causes hairs in a canal to flop over such that you can deduce the abstract meaning in my mind and build a version of it in your own mind. That's such an odd way. If I say, hey, pass the salt, and I'm doing this through this utterly magical mechanism of vibrating air molecules between you and me, hmm. Right, And the purpose is to get the salt from your side of the table to my side of the table. What a mundane thing to happen. In, a in, in other words, Brett is saying, well, we're... So here you have not just one mind who's having experiences and you know having dreams in their head, but you have two minds. And these two minds can actually connect. And they connect via this... this this material world in which we share. What, what a strange thing this is. In the universe by such an odd means. Why am I able to put an abstract thought into your mind from across well, the room? Uh, no, no, no one ever said this wasn't strange. It's ev everything is strange. No, I think it's but, preposterous. I think it's like yeah. saying that but, a but coastline then, but con gets longer to what? as you measure it more closely. But I mean, this is the this is the joke. You know, people say life is strange, but you know, I say compared to what? I don't know who. This is Randy Newman or somebody. But the what are you comparing it to? Like this is everything looked at closely disgorges its utter strangeness. Um. Let's put it this way. I do believe in parsimony. And so my point is not that it isn't all very... Okay, parsimony. Again, parsimony is, is, if you look it up on the Google Dictionary, you'll notice kind of the common usage about someone who is, is, is miserly. But, but there's also the scientific usage, which is the, the, the simplest possible, sort of like Occam's razor, the simplest possible explanation is the most elegant or perhaps the most likely. Very, very strange because it is. My point is we ought to minimize the necessity of strangeness to our explanations as much as possible because as we allow ourselves strangeness in our foundational claims, our thinking uh, devolves into madness. 
Well, no, I, I think, I mean, strangeness, I think, is just, it's ineradicable in just in every case. It's not that, I mean, it's, it's, there's a fundamental strangeness to the fact that anything exists, right? However it exists, whether lawfully or randomly, uh, there's, I mean, I mean this, is, this, is, this is where, like, if you look closely enough at what's happening or what seems to be happening, then ideas that sound like they add a, a, a whopping dose of strangeness to the picture don't actually add much at all. So like the idea that this might be a simulation, right? Well, is that really much stranger than what seems to be going on when you actually, it's, it's, it's more, I mean, it's, it's not, parsim- I'll grant you it's not parsimonious, or at least, you know, not, you know, absent, so, you know, taking a certain argument seriously, it's not parsimonious, but it's, I mean, everything that everything that we think is happening is so bizarre that it's it's a um, and and our engagement with it is so bizarre. I mean, this is this is I don't know if you've followed Donald Hoffman's work at all, but he's a um, a, a cognitive uh, psychologist who um, you know has this kind of user interface theory of of consciousness. And and uh, I will have I think before this comes out, I will have just released a podcast with him where um, Anik and I interviewed him. And, you know, his argument, you know, the TED Talk version of his argument is that we... Con- what we think of as our engagement with reality, you know, our, our conscious perception of reality is like, is, is very much analogous to a, a user interface, like on a desktop of a computer. And, you know, you know the, the trash bin or the blue folder icon is, bears really no relationship to what is in fact true at the base layer of reality. Now, we've talked about Don Hoffman quite a bit early on and when I started making videos. Now, what's, what's interesting, what Sam, what Sam and his illustration of Don Hoffman here seems to miss is that, well, the trash can on your Windows machine or the blue folder or whatever icon you have doesn't relate to, well, relate to what? Well, the little zeros and ones that are on the, that are on the storage device on your electrical equipment. Um, but why is it in the shape of a trash bin? Why is in the shape of a folder? Because actually, that very much um, that that very much connects with what's in our minds about the functionality of the thing that we're trying to do on our computer. And whereas there isn't, you know, to look at let's say the homuncular idea, there isn't a little file folder in our brain but these are all what are these these are all again and now we're going to get into brett's idea of metaphorical truth these are all ideas of okay this is functionally how we are imagining the thing that we are operating and it has very little connection to now follow me along here, other images we have in our minds about what's going on in the computer. Because after all, what is going on in the computer isn't something we can see. Now, we, because we have this long chain of of technology that we have developed, we believe that the software is is they're making all this the programming is all changing the signals all down to this huge stream of zeros and ones that gets that gets stored magnetically or or in an you know magnetically in an ssd in a solid state drive and just this huge chain of zeros and ones and that all gets processed so um but but even conceptually those those zeros and ones charge or no charge uh, in a in a substrate 
I mean, this is this is what we're talking about. I mean, switches have come down to the the presence or 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 lack of presence of an of a of an electrical charge. Okay, that's all what it's boiled down to. And so, here's an interface, and it's saying, well, just like in a computer, we manage icons. But so on one hand, yes. We're not lining up all those little zeros and ones. That would be tedious. It's all boiled down and built up into this interface. But that interface and the trash cans and the file folders actually relate to things in our manifest image world. And in fact, when we're operating the computer, the manifest image is controlling, is colonizing the zeros and ones. So there's actually something going on there. And, and this aspect of it seems to sort of get, well, this is part of what we deal with, with relevance realization. That's not the relevant piece that we're thinking about, because what we're thinking about now is sort of the dislocation between ourselves and this data. And, and, it's, and it's data. And it's just, it's useful uh, to, to think about these things, but, you know, the blue pixels of the folder do not in any way represent what's actually going on, uh, you know, at the at the base layer of, of. Because when you think about okay, what's actually going on? What does that sentence refer to? Are you talking about the? Are you talking about the electrical charges? Are you talking about the logic of zeros and ones and all of the math that's built into that? Is that what's actually going on? I mean, what what do you mean by what's actually going on? Of code, and uh, we are, and he has a Dar Darwinian argument about why this would be so. But uh, it's not it's not just that we are not totally in touch with reality as it is. We are basically, and 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 again, reality as it is. What is that? Is that an atomic? metaphor is that a wave metaphor is it an iconic metaphor what exactly is and and you cannot then this is why brett's about to say what he's going to say and i already know because i've watched the tape um no, let me say. not remotely in touch with reality as it is and we have a we're, we're in a, a a simulacrum of something which is you know it is as strange as if it were a, a and Jonathan Peugeot wants to have a conversation with Brett Weinstein, and I hope they have it, because and this is exactly the point that Jonathan wants to make, his metaphorical truth. Tell me what truth other than metaphorical you're wielding with the vibration of the air hitting the little, the little uh, hairs in my ears, which gets translated into brain signals, which connects up with this amazing world and enormously complex thing that we're doing together to try to to try to do what exactly simulation well uh, to me on the one hand this seems like it has to be almost uncontroversial that we are sensitive to certain stimuli and completely insensitive to others means that what we experience as reality is the dimmest edit that allows you to maneuver without tripping over stuff and injuring yourself and I love that language, the dimmest edit. I mean, Brett, <laughs> Brett's a master with taking, I can see why he was a tremendously effective teacher. Um, he is, you know, astoundingly articulate with a lot of this stuff. You know, that we have enough information to improve our odds substantially of getting through the world, but we don't have anything like the ability to observe the world directly. So some of it and 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 you know okay, ability to observe the world directly we are observing the world directly but we're observing the world directly in a certain way and with all of the diminishment that is necessary again go back through all of the jordan peterson stuff all of the john verveke stuff with all of the diminishment necessary so that we can deal with the world again verveke's relevance realization when i walk into the room this this little center of consciousness that i have that that jordan peterson talks about when he talks to roger scruton and says you know we're looking at in a sense a cartoon which is a which is a which is a total diminishment of the world down into this interface that i can deal with and and again now now 
we should pay attention to how much of the manifest image is absolutely present here. Because when I say that, when I when there's the I in this conversation, we're already in the manifest image. And that because that is the only way that we actually pass the salt or enter the room or understand the idea. We're deep into the manifest image and we can't escape it because that in fact is the interface through which we do to the degree that there's a we and to the degree that we do anything in the world. But maybe I'm not getting it. Fully. Yeah, it well, seems it, like I mean, he has a, a just a stronger claim built into it, which is that, you know, when you do the the game theoretic analysis of the fitness functions, fitness since fitness is the only actual signal in, in Darwinian terms and truth isn't a signal at all, fitness, it, being in touch with reality is just that the probability of being in touch with reality at all essentially goes to, goes to zero in competition with fitness over uh, enough. In now, I, I want to take fitness and, and use Verveke's fittedness and, and again bring in his relevance realization because what's happening See, see, almost within now the, the modernist frame, when Sam Harris uses the word truth, he's imagining, and he's only imagining, and he's imagining into the degree that Brett talks about infinity. He's imagining somehow a grasp on something far larger than any human being can grasp. That's what he means by truth. And, and so, you know, again, and I think Brett said it very well, there's a, there's a sense in which, in which Don Hoffman, what he's saying is, is obvious. Interation, iterations of gameplay. So well, maybe just, this is a good place to maybe shift topics slightly, right. um, but that does seem to me like another way of speaking about metaphorical truth that and in fact, I got into this in a recent podcast with Jim Rutt, where my argument was that um, color is, in effect, a sort of uh, useful fiction. It's not that the wavelengths aren't real, but our categorizing them and painting our world, our internal world, with them in order to figure out where one object starts and another stops, that that mm -hmm. is uh, a highly useful um, falsehood Dep now now what's interesting is because is, is that wavelengths somehow are at a different level than color and i un i completely understand why that that's instinctive for us to look at it that way but we should look at ourselves looking at it that way so then when um so then when brett made this statement I was obviously nosy and interested, and I didn't know who Jim Rutt was. And in fact, I got the spelling wrong a few times. But uh, eventually, thanks to Google, I prevailed, and I listened to the whole thing, and I found the part of the podcast which is relevant to the conversation. Wow. And it comes at a uh, minute, thir one, one hour and 13 minutes. So that that was the trigger. And and now I didn't know who Jim Rutt was. I didn't know, you know. Apparently, these two go way back, and they share some political um, ideas. And you know, it was kind of interesting listening to the whole thing. But then when it got to this part, I thought, yeah, this was you know somewhere somewhere in Brett's mind when he's talking to Sam, you know, salience, bang, oh yeah, this conversation with Jim Rutt. And in fact, I thought Brett stated some things in this podcast in a very clear way that makes it worthwhile to go ahead and, and play some of this. The reason that my view on this is contentious is that the so-called new atheists, and I am going to use that term, I, I believe uh, Sam Harris uses that term sometimes, so it has at least a certain degree of legitimacy. The difference is I believe that religion must have evolved, that the meaning of longstanding religious traditions is a Darwinian meaning, which does not imply that in our modern circumstances that these ancients... Now, I'm not exactly sure what he means by the meaning must have a Darwinian meaning. ...stories 
are the guide to what we should be doing. That is likely to be true in some cases, but it is almost certain not to be true in many others. So these stories guide us to do what we should be doing. Now, pay attention, and we've talked about this right from this, pay attention to the shoulds. Because again, if you go back and I might play some, I might replay some of that stuff from um, Daniel Bonavac, um, Wilfred Sellers' observation that the line between the scientific image and the manifest image is the normative, is the should. So, so whenever you use that word should, you are speaking within the manifest image. You are not that that word does not belong in the scientific world as a normative statement. The fact is that Darwinian evolution does not prepare us for the environments in which we live. It prepares them for the environments from which we came. And we don't live in the environments where religious traditions evolved. So in some sense, even a recognition that these are a kind of ancient wisdom. Now, now again, pay attention. There's what do you mean by environment? Because surely the layer of the physical world is the same as it was when these religious traditions involved. What evolution happened that changed the world? Are you asserting that the physics has changed? No. Are you asserting that the genetic code for human beings has changed? Or maybe only slightly. What aspect of the world has changed since then? ...that has been encoded uh, in a cultural package that is easily transmitted. Even that recognition leaves us with the profound sense that we must now figure out what to do next because those stories are not up to the challenges of the 20 first century. Those stories are not up to the challenges of the 21st century. And again, if you go back and you listen to Brett Weinstein talk to Alistair McGrath, that's, of course, this is Brett's big project. Those stories are not up to the challenge in order to move us towards what we should do. Okay, well, should do, now we're going to bring in telos, should do to what end? Should do for what purpose? Because the physical world hasn't changed. What 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 in our world is is making the should no longer viable? But um, what I've found is that, and I, I think there's a historical path here. We even 20 years ago lived in a paradigm in which the fact of being an atheist made a person suspect in the eyes of the majority. There's a question about whether or not an atheist, for example, could be elected to the highest office in the land. And new atheism arose in response to that paradigm. The problem is it drew the picture far too simply and quite unfairly to those who retain some connection to their religious past. In other words, it had a sociological problem, a sociological offense. Now, it's it's interesting, again, when we're asking ourselves, now, what, what, what environment is Brett thinking of here? And what, what, are, what, is, what is that em- environment filled with? And what I've been saying is that religion shows all of the har- hallmarks of being a Darwinian adaptation, and that therefore it is as deserving of a proper Darwinian treatment as an eye or a wing or an enzyme. Now, now this proper Darwinian treatment, we should pause and imagine what is a, what, what is a Darwinian treatment. Now again, by definition, Darwinian process has no telos. The, the dinosaurs are no more right or wrong than the mammals in terms of their rulership of the world according to Darwin. It is all the fittedness of the moment within a time frame, within a time span, within change of time. And this again, where we've got, we've got Verveke's relevance realization and his comments on Darwin. I've really got to dig that up. I really have to do is listen to the whole 50 hours again because... I've got remnants of it back in my head, and 
or or some some huge Verveke fan should go back and catalog the whole darn thing with hyperlinks so that I could find it. Anyway, um, okay, so so we're we're bringing a Darwinian framework into this conversation, and Brett is saying we should we should understand religion through a Darwinian lens, which means that it's adaptive, which means that the winners and losers of religion are so because they somehow gave their hosts an adaptive advantage over their rivals, something like that. That has inflamed many of the people at the forefront of the new atheist movement because in some sense I think they see it as coddling a perspective that is anti-scientific. Ironically, many of the people in religious communities who have felt quite beaten up by the new atheists are responding positively to this message. They don't agree with it because of course the first thing I say is I don't believe anything supernatural is going on in the There's that word universe. But Simply to be taken seriously and to be told, I don't believe that you are suffering from a delusion or that you have a mental pathology, that you are in fact um, adhering to these traditions because they have a historical importance. Now, notice that these are all sociological um, elements of status. And now, it could, now, if, if, um, if those who believe in, if the religious um, felt the license and desire to kill the irreligious, um, w- how would that impact the Darwinian process? Um, you know, the Protestant Reformation happens at a time and a place where, you know, there was a, the, the Roman Catholic Church had the, the reach and the will to act in a fairly totalitarian manner, and that, that certainly didn't pass away quickly from the Protestant churches either. So, so there's a lot going on here. That has uh, created an awful lot of goodwill amongst um, thinking believers, of which there are quite a large number, and it has inflamed the, uh, the new atheist community who uh, I think sees it as a as a betrayal, I'm... and and of course Jordan Peterson was right in the middle of that, and and some of the anger that surrounded him was it was betrayal. Jordan Peterson should be a new atheist, and Jordan Peterson was saying things like, "We um, abandon the teaching of books like the Bible at our peril," and that that really annoyed Sam Harris. Hoping that as things settle down, the new atheist community will come to understand that A, whether they like it or not, the argument is correct. Evolution has produced religion. We know that that must be the case for reasons I've argued elsewhere. So social pressures in the story verse have produced the kinds of stories and books that we today identify as religious and that these ideas and practices and stories gave to previous generations an adaptive advantage over their rivals that played itself out in history. That's what I understand Brett as saying. And that that being the case, if we attempt to move forward on the basis that religion is a mass delusion, then ultimately what we are doing is we are undermining the credibility of evolutionary thinking rather than advancing the Enlightenment ball. In other words, the idea that religion is a delusion, which you can find commonly in new atheist texts, religion should be described as a mental illness, that that this itself is fails the Darwinian test, and therefore, um, well, actually, if the new atheists lived in other places of the world, we, we, we cannot forget time and place context for these conversations. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the Islamic world in these, in these conversations. But 
the dark, what, what Brett is saying is that this assertion by the new atheist fails the Darwinian test. Well, that's interesting because let me, let me unpack. This is this is Jim Rutt, and he's this is all new to him now. So this is I didn't know anything about who Jim Rutt was, and Jim's gonna be a little transparent about some of his old own views here. Well, it's on, he's, he's got his own podcast, so he likes talking, kind of like someone else you're looking at. I call that. First, I'll point the audience to a very interesting book called "Breaking the Spell: Religion as a Natural Phenomenon" by Daniel Dennett who is sometimes considered one of the new atheists. But in that book, he actually goes through the evolutionary and adaptive arguments for religion and seems to buy the fact that they did indeed evolve and they were indeed adaptive to provide you know, group cohesion, uh, to you know, distinguish us and from them, etc. Now, it's interesting that in many ways we have biologists trying to suss out the Darwinian processes of ideas instead of historians, for example. Um, one would imagine historians would be the ones who would be looking at the evolution of ideas. Uh, anthropologists at, at a very, at sort of a pre-classical period, but um, it's interesting that we're, we're taking what is predominantly a biological metaphorical system and applying it to a, a, a historical, a verbal historical system. So there is some tradition even amongst the new atheists in that perspective. On the other hand, I would accept what you said is absolutely true. Evolution, religion almost certainly evolved. In fact, one of my fun games when I meet a new anthropologist, and uh, one of the fun things about our Santa Fe Institute community, we've always had a number of anthropologists and archaeologists in it. It seems kind of far afield, but it's been the case. I always ask them, in your field of study, has there ever been the equivalent of this obnoxious 16-year-old kid who challenged the uh, religious orthodoxy with a question like, why don't we do the rain dance in Village A, not do the rain dance in Village B, and see if there's a difference in rain? <laughs> and every one of them, and most of them are atheists themselves, have said, absolutely not. Such a thing would be utterly inconceivable in a uh, you know, pre-modern person. And, and so that's led me to believe that the phenomenon known as religion has been ubiquitous as far back. And now, this illustration is very interesting because... If you read the Bible, religious people are always paying attention to, if you pull back something from, let's say, the book of Judges, the fleece of Gideon. Our religious people are constantly doing this. They're constantly doing this because, you know, some of the, some of the things that they're looking for are, are very tangible. They, you know, Elijah pops up. This is in the book of Kings. Elijah pops up and says, no more rain on you, Ahab and Jezebel. And then, of course, they'll have the showdown at Carmel where they're looking for, I mean, Jim Rutt seems to imagine that this, and I would assume what he means by this is scientific thinking, looking at input A and input B versus outputs. Uh, people do this naturally. You can find it again and again and again and within the Bible. You look at the book of Deuteronomy. Look at the promises and curses at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. If you keep my covenant, you will have these things. If you fail to keep my covenant, you will have these curses. And the question, the disconnect between these things is a constant source of attention in the psalmist, in the Old Testament prophets, in the New Testament, all along the way. People are, in fact, doing religious things in order to get certain outcomes. And in fact, if you go through my sermons, of which there are many, many hours of video, which you could imagine, even some of the last few years, this is 
This is always a topic. This is a topic in the book of Job. In the book of Job, Job is an upright man and he does everything and there is a, there is a, a wager between God and, and the accuser and Job is only good because it pays. And so God says, go ahead and wipe out his kids, wipe out his wealth. Job's wife, Job sits on a pile of ashes and, and Job's wife says, curse God and die. It, the, the idea that there is, there, that ancients somehow were not, were not aware of the connection between their religious rights and the actions at hand, that, that simply is wrong if you read any ancient or religious text. In fact, it is all over the place. And, and the fact that we don't buy it is interesting to us. Now, now, I would argue that, and I've made this argument many times in places, that in fact, when people become post-Christian, I don't find them losing this train of thought in any way, shape, or form. What I find them is now they've, they've lost conversations about providence and God and prayer and going to church, and now they're chasing karma. Or they're chasing astrology in the New York Times. And this is a natural way for human beings to behave. Now, in a sense, it would be more rational if the atheists were saying that this habit in human beings is something that must be purged or destroyed, or, or maybe human beings that think this way are a lower evolution than ones that don't, but in fact, all of these all of these scientists are, in fact, thoroughgoing humanists. And, in fact, their humanism comes on display when it comes to the morality of the things that they are proposing. As we know, and for it to have been ubiquitous, despite its high cost, it must have been adaptive in some fashion. So what you say is true. How in other words, it must have worked, at least in the minds of the people doing it, because it was very high cost, and we know they did it, so... Now, were they wrong? Were they dumb? Were they superstitious? What was going on? Maybe they were different creatures from what we are. Well, apparently not. If you look at normal people all over the place reading their horoscopes and talking about karma and on and on and on and on. However, this is where maybe I turn one step further around the bend. That doesn't mean it's not a mass delusion. I mean, it's just not true. Thor did not, does not cause thunder. Zeus does not throw lightning bolts. And every time science has made an incursion into the world of the metaphysical, science has always been right. The metaphysicians have always been wrong. Wow. That's a big statement. Care to prove that? So it, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say it, it was evolutionary, it was adaptive, and it's a mass delusion. Um, is color a mass delusion? It's color, uh, it depends on what, uh, what you're talking about. We have, we have our rods and we have our cones, right? And the, uh, I forget which one's which, the, I think it's the cones that cones react to color. Cones are for the color, color. yeah. We, ju we just had an enormous statement made, completely unproven, and now asked to, you know, engage with a certain degree of biology that most of us learned in later elementary or junior high, a little fuzzy on the, and, and again, you know, no, we all get fuzzy. What are the ro rods? What are the cones? How do our eyes work? But what we are running around with are these stories in our minds about how the world works. And he just laid a huge one out there, an entire categorical statement about these two stories. And now when asked to get just a little bit into the weeds of what a junior high kid, what he probably learned in junior high, suddenly things get fuzzy. What does that say about the relative power of stories versus what he would imagine as being science? Yep. Right, and so they fire under different frequencies. So uh, we have in our brains, we get different signals from the different colors. So I would say colors are real. Uh, color is not a delusion. No, but the experience of color is, uh, it is, well, let's put it this way. When we look at photos of Saturn, for example, sometimes you'll see true color photos, and sometimes you'll see photos in which the color wheel has been rotated to highlight things that are, hard to see with the standard color. Okay, so we would say it's false color. Right. 
But the fact is, the experience of color that you have inside your mind, in fact, the idea that the, uh, the room you are in is visible is a mass delusion of a kind. The room you're in is also filled with radio waves and they're bouncing off things in particular ways. You just don't happen to have a detector that organizes that information into some sort of subjective experience. So you experience the room as empty of radio waves and full of color and the color is a trick of the mind that allows you to quickly categorize objects as distinct from each other so that you know where one starts and the other stops. And and if you go back to Jordan Peterson's biblical series and his maps of meaning, he'll go into snakes and color and pattern and all of those things, all of those things that caught our attention now two plus years ago. My point is, I'm not saying that it's a delusion. I believe it is a useful heuristic, right? It is a heuristic that is not analytical. It is a heuristic that is experiential and a lot. And in fact, the room, your the the image of the room that you are immersed in is also a mass heuristic. And it's it's communal enough that we can engage productively with each other with respect to these things quite easily. It's 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 all a metaphor. As you to navigate the world quickly without thinking about it, but certainly somebody could portray it as a delusion in the same sense that we can portray belief systems that have made people successful as a delusion. But the connotation of the word delusion is unfair. The fact is we're talking about compendiums of adaptive belief. And to the extent that you want to take anything which is not a perfectly literal belief and say it's a delusion and and you're gonna have to tell me what on earth you mean by a literal belief and you're gonna have to use words and if i'm gonna remember it it's gonna have to be in a story because that's how this interface works and not just this one but pretty commonly along the line because we've all learned to organize our lives in terms of a story and then you're going to end up dragging in many of the models that we use in science too which are also approximate I would say this is qualitatively different. They make specific claims about the nature of the universe and they're never found to be true. Yeah. They're just minute just wound up saying that they were adaptive in order in other words they were true enough to afford certain communities competitive advantage over other communities. And 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 that people did lots of A B testing and 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 on the basis of whether it was sociology of religion or what not they preferred certain schemes certain stories certain representations certain patterns of activity of belief over others and these proved to be an adaptive advantage and now you just simply dismiss them did you not listen to anything that Brett said now the sun is at the center of the universe you know argued. Uh, is the oh okay is the sun is at the center what do you mean by center from a metaphysical perspective they were wrong we were from a metaphysical perspective right you know was... they were wrong we were right where were you what do you mean by you are you connecting yourself with a group of people that go back through the through the ages what essence is at the center of that grouping of those people that you have just made. With respect to color, I mean, that falls in. And in fact, well, Galileo. Did Galileo believe that Jesus died for his sins? To my area of cognitive study of consciousness, and that's what we call qualia, the uh, subjective experience of color. And I would say that's a completely different thing than a system of beliefs. Uh, that operates in a different domain entirely, so I'm not sure that compares. How do you organize the qualia? How do you remember it? How do you make sense of it? How do you wield it? Towards what end do you wield the systems with which you manage this qualia? Person was particularly apt. Well, but the question is, where are you going to draw the line? How literal does a scientific model have to be before you're going to exclude it from the realm of delusion? I agree with you that there is a distinction between a claim about where the sun is relative to the earth, but you also have...
it's not relative to the Earth, it's relative to everything else in space. And if we're going to think about everything else, what we have to do is adopt a schema which is in fact pointed towards certain things. In fact, whether you in a moment treat the Earth at the center or the Sun at the center is directly connected to the thing you are trying to do with the information. When you're deciding what time do I get up in the morning, you say the sun rises at. No, we, what, the, the, the earth rotates at? No, the sun rises at because that's the bit of information that is useful to you on this place in the planet with respect to the sun. Now, if you are in fact trying to go to Mars, you're going to use a different schema in order to plan those calculations. But for the vast majority of us, that other system is in fact the appropriate system. I go to my, I go to my little app on my phone and there you have the sun doing this. Because according to the type of information I need at the moment that I need it, the relevant information is in fact this. It is not this, and it is not we're on some distant arm of, of this particular galaxy with many, many more galaxies. That information is not helpful in terms of the thing that I, deeply embedded within the manifest image, wish to accomplish. Models in science that are approximate and they get better over time. You know, we say they're approximate. The whole doctrine of science is that everything that we say we think is true today, we know is wrong in some detail, in some way, and that over time, ex experiment and data will, in some cases, fine tune what we believe and sometimes turn it completely on its head. It's amazing. You know, Einstein entirely turned on its head the, the Newtonian perspective of absolute space and time. Yet we use Newton all the time to accomplish the kinds of, to address the kinds of problems we find in the world today. You won't use Newtonian mechanics to figure out who has to pay what in an automobile accident. And every good scientist knows that and, and knows it in their bones. You know, religion is the exact opposite. Knows it in their bones. Is that where we know things? Do you, is, is, did science teach you that we know things in our bones? <laughs> Of that, I think maybe you're mis you're mishearing me in some sense. That because it sounds to me like you think that there are circumstances in which we should prioritize factual claims coming from religion in spite of scientific evidence. That is not what I am saying. What I'm saying is that those claims have persisted because they have been effective. And so, for example, you have in the Old Testament, you have a repeated invocation of the concept of filth, basically shit, and the deity not wanting filth in certain places, like in the middle of camp. Now, that belief that there is some force in the universe that cares where filth ends up is not literal. It is literally false but it is metaphorically true. If, if, can you really say that there is, it is literally false that there is some force in the universe that cares where filth is? Well, there's a lot of forces that care where filth is. In the sense that it prevents disease from spreading in camp. So what I, at the fair comparison, is for a population that exists thousands of years before the germ theory of disease, would you have them abandon a belief that a deity cares where filth ends up? Now, the way you pursue the question is interesting. Would you have them? Well, what, what do you care about whether or not the Israelites took a dump outside the camp or just did it inside the camp? And, and why didn't the Puritans learn this? Because, you know, they just throw the, their, they just throw the, you know, right into the street and, you know, medieval cities could be real cesspools. Um, you know, what, what, what happened there? There are, there are issues with Brett's illustration here, but I think, I think it carries the, 
I think it carries the load fairly well in some way that, well, maybe that there were adaptive advantages that, that weren't necessarily directly involved with the decisions that they made, sort of like, well, when we got rid of all the horses in urban areas in the early modern period and went to automobiles. Now, we might one day decide that that decision because all of these decisions have time frames, that that decision was a poor one because, well, we cooked the atmosphere or not. Again, don't go ahead, have the debate about climate science in the comment section. I don't care. But, you know, these are the trade-offs we make. Waiting for the Enlightenment to deliver the tools to understand what microbes and pathogens are, or would you have them utilize their shorthand belief for something in the universe cares where this stuff goes, uh, waiting for a better, deeper understanding to supplant it when the evidence says it's time to do that. Now, the would you have them is, is fun because this is a, we should pay attention to what we're doing here. This is sort of this, I am going to pull myself out of here, go back and look in time, and I am going to exert my judgment upon this situation back then. That's interesting. And would you, well, would you have, would you like to have had the the parents of, of Joseph Stalin or, or Adolf Hitler not know these things? I mean, it's just, it's just kind of a funny idea. But, you know, again, fair enough. I think we all know what he's doing, and, and it's a good argument. That's where I would fall out. And I think that's all right. You know, in fact, the line I draw is Darwin. Here was a big question. Where the hell did life come from? What are humans really? And before Darwin, where did life come from? What are humans? Does Darwin really answer those questions? It provided a good answer to that. You know, believing some story about how it all happened seemed to me reasonable. But that was a long time ago. You know, that was over 150 years ago. And yet, long time ago. People are still clinging to these things. And it's not to say they aren't adaptive. And I absolutely agree. They almost certainly work because they're expensive and they've existed in essentially every culture that we know about. But I would put them in the same basket as xenophobia and patriarchy, things that probably were adaptive and useful in our past, especially in our Pleistocene path. And now it's time to pitch them. Ah, so I, I agree with you about it is time to pitch them. But I would say we have to qualify that. A, if we are going to get people to listen to us about the necessity of moving towards a system in which we are governed by what it is we know, we have to understand what the hazards that come along with that are. In other words, there are some realms where we know a lot, chemistry, for example. There are some realms where we are still pretty new at it, biology. There are things about these compendiums of belief that we can't know. We don't necessarily know how these biblical texts, for example, have served the populations who believed in them, and therefore we've got Chesterton's fence issue with respect to throwing these things out. So what I'm... Uh, that's where do you place the fence, G.K. Chesterton's point. ...concerned about is that in hearing me say something other than the standard atheist line about, well... It's time to walk away from these beliefs, whatever they are, and fully embrace the Enlightenment model. Well, I'm on board with the idea that we have to be governed by the Enlightenment model, but I would caution that we are not yet in a position to simply say, here's what's true and this is what it implies about how we should live. We're still coming to understand that. Darwin may seem like he's a very long time ago, but really it isn't very long at all. Uh, in terms of the, the time necessary to comprehend our situation. And our understanding of human evolution has actually lagged quite a bit behind our understanding of the evolution of other creatures, in part because human beings evolve in a fundamentally different way. So I'm, I am not... And fundamentally different way. And that brings me to this video where Brett lays out the fundamentally different way we did evolve. And this is a, I think this, I think he, again, I love using Brett because he's so good at this. And he's, he's, he's really, really good at this. Well, let, let's get into some of the meat of what we're talking about tonight. Um, I wonder if you could maybe 
give us a, a brief and hopefully layperson friendly account of, of how you imagine religious belief arose um, in, an in a strictly evolutionary sort of paradigm, Brett? Sure. So the first thing I would say is what we don't tend to understand when we take a strict classic Darwinian perspective about humans is that human beings are the far end of a continuum. Most creatures have essentially one mode of inheritance, and it is genetic. We have a second mode, and it is cultural, and we are not complete. Now, when he says inheritance here, it's a, helpful to remember that he's talking information passing through time. Completely alone, all of the other mammals have a cultural mode, and almost all of the birds have it, but that's a tiny fraction of the biota. And again, if you read some G.K. Chesterton, you will note that comparatively, the amount of information that birds or the amount of culture that birds and other mammals have compared to human beings, it's not they have this much, we have this much, they have this much, we have this much. It's not little, it's not a little amount over, it's a huge difference between them. But for those creatures that do have this second mode, what you have is a, is a locale where information can be stored in a non-genetic form and it can be acted upon by the very same kinds of Darwinian forces that shape genes. Okay, it's acted upon by Darwinian forces, okay, that, that shape genes. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, so you've got this, again, to take some of Verveke's language, you've got an agent arena relationship. There's an arena and to go, you know, that, and that arena is not neutral. There are things in that arena that in fact are causing problems for, and, and here again, we have different questions of scope of purview. Are we looking at individuals? Well, what do we mean by individuals? Usually a creature bound by skin or are we looking at a population you know that this we all of this language is tremendously useful but it it so often covers up the the details within it which are in fact important because these creatures whether they be plants or animals because plants act and we see plants turning towards the sun or flowers opening and closing depending on if it's daytime or nighttime and in fact there's there's lots of actions at other levels it's a very living environment um but within all of this there's there's action that's going on and some of the action is conscious and we are the the ability to which we can discern which actions fall within a realm of consciousness and which ones don't we're actually very limited at that so in one sense dawkins introduced this idea with the concept of memes it became clear in my conversation with him in october though that he didn't take the concept of memes very seriously that he thought that it was loosely analogous to the genetic Darwinian process, but it didn't have important consequences. What I would argue to you is that we humans have offloaded a large fraction of the, uh, the adaptive landscape to what I would call the software layer, right? Our genomes do not create a functional creature. We are utterly helpless at birth, and our very long childhoods are a time period in which one and, and, and we are, I, I love how he says that, we are utterly helpless at, at birth. And in fact, the care of a human being from birth on is full of behaviors that are both seem genetic in some ways and cultural, and we can't tell the difference, okay? Um, and, and so what we try to do is we look at, well, maybe every culture is doing this. And might it be genetic then? Well, we don't know. But, but we know, and I, again, I love the way he said that, because a human being isn't just plopping this code. And, and this is where the, you know, the abortion and the viability argument comes in, because 
you know, viability seems, well, it keeps getting pushed back as we have science, you know, you know, we, we can, the baby leaves the womb at such and such a rate and we have an incubator and we have all of this other stuff and introduce all of these other drugs and try and, and form the baby outside the womb. But even once you get after birth, what, what is, what is viable about that child then? If you, if you, if, if the mother gives birth to the child and you lay it in a field, that child is not viable. In fact, the child and the mother are together and, and, and a whole realm of behaviors and actions go into the viability of that child. And again, the, the culture must come in terms of, and, and we're just, we're just drenched in culture of, of what to do and how to do it. And, and it's so close to us, we barely see it. One can discover a functional creature. We are of the, uh, the adaptive landscape to what I would call the software layer, right? Our genomes do not create a functional creature. We are utterly helpless at birth. And our very long childhoods are a time period in which one can discover and basically self-program the software necessary for life. Now, what we do during that time is we largely pick up the wisdom of our immediate ancestors, who we meet, and then we augment it with things that we discover that they didn't know, which is a very small fraction of what we come to understand. So, if you take that paradigm, what you'll realize is that we get handed a belief system that individuals whose belief system is a better match for the world have advantages. People whose belief systems are a poorer match for the world have disadvantages. Now... We're very much knocking on Don Hoffman's door here because, well, these are metaphors and these are operating systems that we are using to make our way in the world. That's what we're talking about. And these operating systems are full of stories and, and they are full of how to act, what we do, what we should do. Don't poop in the village, go outside the village, and now, you know, have a latrine. I mean, we, people go from North America, I mean, people would come to the Dominican Republic and say, there's these invisible things that are called germs that you should wash your hands about. And the Dominicans would be like, yeah, right. Um, at least some Dominicans, not other Dominicans and Haitians and on and on and on. So, so this is all part of this entire project. And of course, we, we tell these in story form, you know, the literal germ theory, there, there's no literal germ theory that you tell to a bate of Haitians who have somehow been incentivized to listen to usually some American college student from the Peace Corps telling them to wash their hands and not let the pigs and chickens run in the house where the kids sit bare bottom on the floor because they're crapping on the floor too. We put it in a story. What we say is that there are things, conceptual things that go through the child and are in their feces and these worms, they grow and, and we have this whole story that happens and the, the, the product of that story is keep poop out of the house. Keep clean. It's the product of the story. It's a functional human community and, and that community is derived by the stories that the community tells. And over time, those belief systems, the narratives that we hand off will be refined by this process. And so this is so certain once you accept that we have these cultural traits and that better ones will inherently be passed on more often than worse ones. It is so certain that effectively we are talking about a tautology. When we talk about, for example, the narratives that go along with the life of Jesus, how is it possible that those narratives were not shaped by the fact that some versions of the story were more compelling? Some versions of the story led to alterations in behavior. And, and you know, he's basically singing Jordan Peterson's song here about the Darwinian shaping of these stories. And, and he made that clear, if you look at my last video, to Sam Harris about what the Bible is. That uh, led populations to outcompete their rivals. These things effectively have to be true. And so therein lies the explanation for all of the belief systems uh, that we find different populations 
having on Earth. They are not inherently in competition with each other. They are adaptations to different times and different places, different obstacles. Um, sometimes a belief system replaces another. Sometimes we have a process analogous to speciation where you'll get you know, a division, for example, between Catholics and Protestants where both continue on, adapted to slightly different uh, uh, parameters. And so um, my... I was going to say, I mean, I'll be interested in Alice's response in a moment, but, but what you've described there, in a sense, is, is this idea that religious beliefs, like perhaps all beliefs of one kind or another, can't, we, we receive them because of their value that has been handed down by the evolutionary process, this, this adaptive sort of, uh, if you like, uh, benefit that it confers on the people who, who hold it together, perhaps in a community. But in that sense, it doesn't have much to say as to whether those beliefs are true uh, in, in a kind of objective way. It's more about their, their usefulness in that way. Well, I would argue that, there, that this is um, not really an obstacle, that in a sense, so what I've defined as something I call metaphorical truth. A metaphorical truth is a belief that if one acts according to the idea that it is true, one outcompetes somebody who will act according to the fact that it is false. Um, so Give an example of, of what that might look like. So in order to maybe make this more concrete and to, to compel you that I'm talking about something very serious and not uh, a nuance, I'll give you my favorite example, which is um, a belief of the, the Moken people of the Andaman Sea. These are the sea gypsies who live effectively their entire lives either on wooden boats or within 100 meters of the shore. Uh, who were in the path of the Boxing Day tsunami that hit Indonesia so hard. And uh, it was imagined that because this entire population lived on the sea and on the shore, that they would have been essentially near wiped out by the tsunami. And it turned out not a single member of this community, as far as anyone knows, was, was injured. Um, the villages were completely leveled, but every single person had been upslope at the point that the tsunami hit. Why? Because they had a, a belief in something called the Lavoon, which is a, a spirit of the ancestors. And the spirit of the ancestors apparently becomes hungry periodically to taste human flesh. And it rises up out of the sea and wipes the world clean. That's a metaphorical belief. It saved every member of this population because at the point that the sea receded just prior to the tsunami, the point at which people who had recently moved to the coast in Indonesia walked out into the, the newly open landscape to see the fish flopping about, the, uh, the Moken people were running upslope because they knew to be terrified, right? That is a belief. It's not literal. There, there is no spirit of the ancestor. I don't know how he can know this, but I don't believe it either. ...that lives in the sea. What there are are tectonic plates that slide violently against each other. Which is another story that's kind of spiritual. But this belief that, that some ancestral spirit lives in the water and that you can recognize that it's about to come on land because the sea suddenly recedes from you is sufficient. So that... And I love that story because it's a great story. And, and it also demonstrates in an ironic way that the story delivery system of the people was in fact in some way if your goal okay now if your goal is to preserve the life of the people that story delivery system was superior in this little context to the modern story with tectonic plates and so on and so forth because lots of other people died okay now here's another question this is where you get into relevance realization because within the small framework of that story that story is has an adaptive advantage over the lack of that story in the general population. Now, it might be that this particular group of people is, in fact, disappearing for all kinds of economic, sociological, religious, political, cultural. That, that entire people, again, if we think about now pay attention to what we're doing here, we are categorizing them as a people, defining them by the stories that they tell, and in that sense, they have an identity in our imaginary. It's, we're doing all of this without even thinking about it. We're so good at this. But, but 
we can take note that, in fact, the delivery system of that religion is superior for saving the life of the people. Their village gets wiped out, but all of them survive. That's a really interesting point. This gets us into, again, I've mentioned John's work a number of times, and and John, of course, scales his whole work around this relevance realization, which I, which is such a, again, I continue to get my mind around a lot of his ideas here that, um, you know, Darwinian at, at each moment, so he, he frames out what's a problem, and then what you do is you look at, you isolate amidst this world of multiple things, you isolate the relevant variable. In the case of this story, the people noticing the receding water was the relevant variable. And instead of doing like all the other supposedly truth-bearing, non-superstitious who went out to say, oh, that fish flopping around is interesting, and then lost their life, the relevant variables were in fact detected and illuminated by the cultural stories of the people and it offered them an adaptive advantage so the people that in fact survived and the children that survived will pass on their genes and their genes are in some loose way connected with these stories and their traditions and on they will go through time as opposed to those who were killed in the Boxing Day tsunami. This is about how to act. What is a problem? What is the problem that is relevant to the moment within, within again, a sequence of nested groupings, identities, time frames, environments, on and on and on and on. As innumerable as the context is, so innumerable are also these things. You know, what is relevant to the situation? What is possible? And again, what is desirable? Because are wanting is huge. So now we're knocking on the door of Jordan Peterson's Darwinian truth that you can find in, in Transliminal 2015. But now pay attention to what we're doing here again. You have the scientific image and the manifest image and, and all of this is ironically nested into this picture. And so we get this sort of picture and this is why it becomes a problem for the humanities, for thinking about what it is to be a human being. We realize at the manifest image level, the surface level, we think of ourselves as rational beings. This is on a level of rationality, of morality. We do things and act in ways that are sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes right, sometimes wrong. We take or fail to take responsibility, but in any case, we have responsibility for our actions. We make decisions, we make choices, we act, and we have to take the responsibility for what we do. We also, within that realm, think of ourselves as free. We engage in practical reason. We say, why should I do that? We think about problems and try to find solutions. Now, at the level of the scientific image, things look very different. The world seems to be governed by either causal, well, either deterministic causal laws or statistical laws, as in quantum mechanics. Um, the science seems to be valued free, free. There really are terms like obligation, responsibility, right, wrong, good, bad, within the framework of that. Imagine a physics class if someone says, okay, the speed of light is this. You say, was well, that good or bad? <laughs> I think it's wrong, right? I just think it's wrong for it. light to go that fast. It's speeding. Um, that, that, there's, uh, there's no way to make sense of that claim, right, within the framework of physics itself. And so, moreover, within that realm, either things appear to be purely determined, which is the way they seem to people at the end of the 19th century, before quantum mechanics, or, at any rate, they seem statistically driven. So either we get determination or we get randomness, but in neither case do we really seem to get anything like rationality or morality. And so we face a problem in understanding what it is to be human. We thought we understood that in terms of being rational agents in a complex world trying to stay alive and solve problems. And then we get this picture of the world and of ourselves that implies actually we're not making decisions, we're not acting freely, and there's no point in talking about responsibility. So in that sense, there really is a clash of these images. There are conflicting claims, competing claims. The scientific image claims to be a complete picture of the world. The scientist basically says, I'm going to give you a theory that accounts for the motion of physical particles, for example, and explains everything about what happens in the world, including your behavior. And it's that completeness claim that gets scary. Because wait, <laughs> what room is left now for rationality? for decision-making, for freedom, 
if everything is ultimately to be explained in terms of the science. There's a marvelous sculpture in the middle of the river in Berlin that illustrates this. It's called Molecule Man. And we have actually several figures grappling and fighting it out in the middle of the river. Um, well, anyway, <laughs> what really is the key difference between the manifest image and the scientific image? We've already talked about the difference between observability and being a theoretical entity that is unobservable. That's one crucial difference. But really, the key difference, according to Sellers, is normativity. It's the gap between is and not. The irreducibility of the personal, that is to say, the manifest image, is the irreducibility of the ought to the is. Now, there's a long argument in the background for that. I used to have you all read that. Now, now the irreducibility, the, the, the line here between them is the normative. All right? The normative has no place in the scientific image. The normative is how we should live, how we should act, that's all in the manifest image. Now, again, if you go back to this, you go back to this picture that he had up there of this little diagram that, oh, everything, the, the manifest image is a product of the scientific image. There's, there's something circular going on here because you can't, in fact, see the you can't in fact engage with the scientific image outside of the manifest image we are manifest image creatures trying to wield the scientific image according to the norms of the manifest image so we have this this uncomfortable circularity going where we say the scientific image is what what is true what is really going on so therefore we should blank well, once you say that word should, you've now re-entered the normative image. We want to use the scientific image to figure out what we should be doing, but the scientific image offers no should. So where's the should coming from? Where's should smuggling? The good is assumed to be obvious. And if again, if you listen to both of these conversations with Sam Harris and with Jim Rutt, Everyone in the conversations assumes they know what the good is. And at someone, if someone from a different culture were to come in from a whole different set of stories, they would say, I don't know about your should. I, my shoulds are different from your shoulds. Now, again, if you read the work of Christian Smith in his earlier career, this, this massive survey he did with the religious and spiritual lives of American teenagers, what all of they expressed was exactly what these other individuals expressed, that should is self-evident, which is a hilarious thing in this supposedly enormously pluralistic culture where a good deal of our pluralism has everything to do about the plurality of our shoulds. And we can say, well, on simple things, you know, running, not being on low ground during the tsunami is a should, unless, of course, you're the army of the Egyptians and the, um, and the Red Sea is coming back in to swallow and kill you. Oh, God should not kill armies. Well, God should not kill innocents. Or God should not, again, all of the nested manifest identity frames are all over this store all over these stories and story is in fact the only way in which we can navigate and manage these frames now i want to bring in tom holland here because his conversation with with um with glenn scrivener hope i got his name right hope i get your name right glenn is is outstanding because again tom holland's story is this tom holland was um you know, a little boy going to Sunday school in the Church of England. He was six years old. He loved dinosaurs. And he sees a picture in some material of dinosaurs with people. He raises his hand for a Sunday school teacher and says, dinosaurs and people didn't exist at the same time. And the Sunday school teacher didn't know what to do. And from that point on, little Tom Holland figured, I have nothing to learn from the church. And the Church of England was always just sort of out there and you know, he went about his life, but not a particularly religious person, very much a secular person until he 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 loved the the heroism and the drama of the classical period of the Romans and the Greeks and made a wonderful career out of writing wonderful history books that read like novels about Romans and Greeks and dynasty and Rubicon and all of those things. And he begins to well, it's a little 
little uneasy about the more he knew, of course, about the Romans and the Greeks of how non-humanistic they were until he writes about Islam and gets embroiled in some of those conversations and someone comes to him and says, why don't you write about your own religion? He's like, and so then he starts writing about Christianity and he begins to recognize that all of these shoulds that are self-evident in all of these conversations, they themselves have a Darwinian or an evolutionary, or a historical path into our consciousness to the degree that we find these shoulds to be self-evident. Christianity has so thoroughly won the war for the moral imagination in the West, and in many ways all over the world, that those who don't identify as Christian, or even as anti-Christian, now use them in the West use Christian moral standards to criticize Christians, Christianity, and the Bible itself. And the hand, it's as if the hand says to the arm, I want no part of you. Well, the problem with my hand saying that to the arm is if you take the hand away from the arm, the hand has no life. And that's exactly the anxiety that Tom Holland and Douglas Murray, if you listen to his conversation with Esther on Unbelievable, it's exactly the anxiety that they are having. Because what if the hand is deriving its life from the arm? Well, and this gets into the question, now you listen to Jim Rutt and, 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 and Sam Harris talk so flippantly about religion. Well, what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about religion? I've asked that question hard about science, but what about religion? What, what exactly is religion? We're chatting as if we know what we mean by science, and I've talked about that quite a bit, but we should ask ourselves what we mean by religion. And someone else sent me, y'all are very generous and helpful video senders to me, and to the degree that I can watch them, I usually try and take a little look, especially if my relevance realizer thinks that, oh, there might be something relevant here. Well, someone sent me this wonderful little video about Tom Holland, did religion exist in the ancient world? Now, the sound quality isn't great, but I'll leave the link in the notes and you can listen to it yourself, but I'm going to play a good bit of it because it's really helpful. Well, this book is my attempt to explore what I think is the most fascinating and the most influential legacy of the classical world into the present. And it's one of the very few that can be traced in a kind of continuous line from antiquity right into the present. I suppose that um, a, a, another one might be the study of Virgil. You know, he did finish the Aeneas, but who cares? It, it, it's still the great masterpiece of Western literature, and it's been studied continuously every year since, since it was finished. But my theme is is a broader one, it's a more influential one. And I'm looking at um, a kind of nexus of beliefs and practices and assumptions and ethics and morals that draw from Greek philosophy, that draw from Roman law, that draw from Persian conceptions of kingship and of good and of evil. <coughs> And above all, of course, it draws from Jewish tradition, from Jewish scripture. And you will have worked out by now that what I'm talking about is what we today call Christianity, and by the second century AD, it was coming to be called Christianity. So this is a, a category, the idea of something called Christianity is something that is very ancient and that continues into the present day. However, in a sense, it is a measure of the impact of Christianity that it has evolved in such a, a multiplicity of ways that that word Christianismos, as used by Christian philosophers back in the second century AD, and our word Christianity, there is a sizable gulf in signification. What we mean by it, 
and what someone back in the second century AD would have meant by it is treacherously different. And by extension, even more so, if I say, well, what is Christianismos? And today people would say, well, it's a religion. And people would probably say that it is one of a number of religions. So Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all these would be categorized as religions. And if, we were to, if I was to say furthermore, you know, well, what, what do you think we mean by a religion? I think probably most people would say, you know, it's slightly kind of ambivalent, slightly contradictory, two contradictory things, but I think above all they would say that a religion is something that um, exists in a kind of distinct way from the rest of society. So you can talk. So religion is a thing that exists in a distinct way from the rest of society. So Jim Rutt and Sam Harris will say, I am not religious. Or what do they mean by that? They might mean that I don't go to church. I don't pray. I don't use as motivational justification for my beliefs, ideas and positions held and reinforced within a community based on writings within a specific group of books and it's usually the Bible plus books within your tradition and scholars within your tradition and mine, Calvin, Abram Kuyper, Herman Bovink, um, Nick Waltersdorf, Alvin Plantinga, Richard Mao, George Marsden, on and on and on, the interpretation of these things. And, and, and so a religion, well, well there, there's this group of ideas over here that are religious, and then there's these other ideas over here that are not religious. They are secular. Well, where do these categorizations come from? Talk about um, church and state. Religion is, is, is something that, you know, it has, an, it, ha, it has a GCSE, for instance. You go and you study religion in, 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 in the GCSE. Um, if you read... Um, book about um, India or about um, the ancient world or something, you'll have chapters on you know, the religion of the Hindus, the religion of um, If you're watching instead of listening to the podcast, again, the sound level of this video is low, so I just turned on this the closed captioning. Maybe that'll help some of you be able to hear what it's saying, or at least read what it's saying. Egyptians, the religion and it's accepted that this is something that is, that, that is separate from the rest of society. In, in other words, we will look at the religion of the Greeks or the religion of the Egyptians and say, well, that's over here. And then usually when we write our histories, we will look at the battles. We will look at the materialistic aspects of the story because, again, we believe that these are the relevant aspects of the story that will yield to the outcomes of history. Now, one might ask, well, where do we get that filter from? Do we get that filter from the Greeks and the Egyptians? Would the Greeks and the Egyptians have told the story in the way that we are telling it? Or does our telling of the story reflect as much of our filters as the evidence that there is whatever is left back from back in their period. Against that, there is also, I think, a sense that, that a religion is about, it's what an individual believes. So you say, you know, what is your religion? Are you, you might say you're a Christian, or a Jew, or a Muslim, or a Hindu, or whatever. It's, it's something that defines you personally, that defines you individually. And now, now again, and he's going to go through this in this video, where does that frame and filter come from? Well, Brett and Tom will both say it comes from history. It's the process of a story verse evolution that is operated on individuals and communities through various mechanisms that are important to us, not just uh, survival of our bodies, but more so probably survival of the ideas. Because if you think genetic and biological systems are complex, 
human systems, human storyverse systems have to be at least as complex. And I would argue orders of magnitude more complex because the diversity of the Logos code is far greater than the diversity of the genetic codes. And there is a kind of lurking sense there of that this is about an individual's relationship with kind of aspect of the divine, an aspect of the supernatural, perhaps a, a personal God. And there's that categorization of natural, supernatural, which is, with it, which is itself obviously a product of this entire evolutionary process. And the problem with this is that um, when we use that English word, religion, and we back project it, and we, we talk about the religion of the Greeks, or we talk about the religion of the Romans, or we even talk about the religion of, of the Jews in, um, back in antiquity, there is a massive, massive risk of anachronism. And really, I want to talk tonight about what that risk is and to demonstrate exactly how it was that our conception of religion today, yes, emerged from antiquity, but over the course of that evolution became something really radically quite different. Now, I've brought with me two books which have been hugely influential on me over the course of my writing about classical antiquity. Um, so this is by Walter Burkert, great German scholar, Greek religion. I mean, it's, it's an absolutely masterly account of what I suppose we might call Greek cultic practices, the Greek gods, um, Greek philosophy even. Um, and there you have it, Greek religion. Um, and then this one, uh, Religions of Rome, um, by John North, Simon Price, and well before she became the world's most famous woman, Mary Beard. Again, <laughs> um, yeah, hugely influential book on me. Um, so I was reading these books while I was, sorry, I was reading this while I was um, writing about, while I was writing Rupon, all the, you know, those 400 years ago. Um, and I was reading this while I was writing about the, the ancient Greeks, the Persian fire. Um, but it, it kind of pressed on me that this word religion was highly difficult. So, and I was kind of alert, sufficiently alert to it, that um, I think the whole way through both Rupon and Persian Fire, I never actually used the word religion. And what's interesting? Think about it. The whole way through Rubicon and Persian Fire, he never really used the word religion. Again, it is our filter that imagines we can tell the story credibly of these people from the outside, okay? Remember the story of color? Well, color's on the inside. We're looking from the outside and we mentally edit out their religion when we tell the story. Why? Because in our minds, it's irrelevant to the fact. Listen to any high school or college student that doesn't like history complain about all the dates and all the battles and all the wars. Well, that's what we imagine to be relevant. And they are hugely relevant. But it's interesting that from the inside, we look at that and say, that's not relevant. The best thing about this is that despite the title of both these books, I think when you read through them, again, they don't really talk about religion. So the headline is there, the title is there. But there's clearly a kind of nervousness on the part of scholars of using this, this word. And part of the reason for that is that um, we don't really have an analogous word in either Greek or in Latin. So the, the, the word that is often um, cited in Greek for, for being equivalent to our word religion is threskeia. Um, when I was translating uh, Herodotus Thrasca was pretty much on every every page. But it was evident that this Herodotus was not talking about anything that we would recognize today as religion. Um, he's he's kind of talking about rituals really. He's talking about 
rituals. Now, pay attention to Brett Weinstein on Unbelievable talking about, well, our biology, our, the genetic code doesn't really deliver for us a human. They pick up, well, that ritual, those enactments, are part of the culture that made people Greek. And it's on every page in Herodotus, but it isn't, and, and you find this in the Bible, just read the Bible and find, do a New Testament search and find out how seldom you find the word religion in the New Testament. In fact, I think just off the top of my head, twice? And, and I think it's in, one of them's at least in the book of James. But pay attention to the filter that we are using here and the cultic practices, the sacrifices, the priesthoods that enable human beings to feel a sense of communion with the gods. Um, and, and, and even the way he said it, to feel a sense of communion with the gods. That, again, another result of our filter. As the word evolves over the course of, um, over the course of the centuries, the word varies, it can mean, um, uh, in the New Testament, for instance, it appears in the New Testament, where it, it kind of seems to mean worship. Uh, and in the writings of uh, Philo of Alexandria, the great uh, Jewish scholar of the first century AD, it, it, it seem, he genuinely seems to use it uh, as meaning sacrifices. So there's something there that is very, it's, it's kind of what we might call religion, but it's not quite. And wonderful example of this at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus has been crucified. He's risen from the dead. He's not yet ascended. And here you have the scene of these Jews worshiping Jesus and some doubt it. Well, of course, there's enormous dissonance. Well, what do you mean they worshiped Jesus? Well, they quite literally, they bowed down before him because that's what you do. But this bowing down is an action that, well, we have a word for it. But when they do it, now you would, you would bow down in front of a master. You would bow down in front of a, we find, if you watch K-dramas, you find people bowing down all over the place. You bow down before Jesus. And it's like, I wait a minute. These are Jews doing this. What's going on? And, and in fact, this is some of what you find. You're reading these ancient texts. They don't necessarily give you the, all the details. People regularly, they, they read through, they, I'm going to read the Bible, so they read through the book of Genesis. Wow, what great stories. They read through half of the book of Exodus, and then suddenly they're, they're into the machinery and the furniture and the practices of the Jewish, of the ancient Hebrew cultic practices with the tabernacle. And they're like, wow, this is boring. Mm. It was obviously important to them. It goes on for quite a while. So, well, what about Latin? Of course, the, the, our word religion derives from a Latin word, religio. And actually, when I was, um, when I was uh, doing, I'm uh, so old that I didn't do GCSEs, I did O-levels, and we did uh, Latin O-level. And one of the, the texts that we did was um, Lucretius's great poem, De Rerum Natura, um, which is much celebrated today as a kind of rationalist, atheistic poem kind of Richard Dawkins in a toga. Um, and there's a famous line in it that, that, that opened the passage of Lucretius that, that I studied at school. It was tantum religio potuit suadere malorum. Um, to such heights of evil is religio capable of inspiring people to behave. So you can see why this is a, this is a line that has a lot of traction in kind of atheist website, so you'll often find it on, on, um, on websites, <laughs> devoted to proving that, that religion is nonsense, that it's all superstition. And back when I did, did my level, you know, we were told by, by our teacher, yeah, religio means religion. So we said, essentially the, the, the meaning of this, of this line is that, that religion is a load of rubbish and it's, it's, it's malevolent rubbish and you should get rid of it. Um, and so, you know, I think I was 15 at the time, lots of, of kind of eager, atheistic giggling at that. Um, I enjoyed that. <clears throat> but there's a problem, which is again, that um, just as with Threskea, religio does not mean religion. 
again, religio has this idea of, it literally means a binding. So it's, it's something that, the, the idea is it's something that binds you to a god, to a deity, to um, a supernatural agent. So it could be a sacrifice, it could be uh, adopting priesthood, it could be... Now, now what he's describing there is the, okay, binding. Well, there's a metaphor. What do you mean I'm bound to this deity? The binding is the sacrifice. The binding is the practice. Um, honoring a, a, a festival, and of course in Rome... And again, honoring a festival. What does that mean? That means you take time out, look at just the language we have, out of your day, of your day, and you go to the festival. It's an obligation. And of course, religious people using that in the contemporary sense understand that because they go to church. They they don't, they, they take time out of their Sunday to attend a religious worship service. As in Greece, although perhaps even more so, there were gods everywhere. And so there were any number of religiones. And there was this kind of pressing sense of anxiety that you, you might miss out on a religio. And then a god would be pissed off and you'd find your life messed up. And on the scale of... In other words, there's a relational level that's going on here. And now, very post-Luther, Protestant, imaginary, we're working in here. But there's a relationship going on here. And if you tick off a god, bad things will happen in your life. And again, this is the, the hungry god of the Boxing Day tsunami. Steer clear of that god. That's what the story says. Of, of the city itself. Road. It, it's a crucial part of what the elite are about, that they have to um, be respectful of the religiones. They have to, um, because by doing that, they ensure that uh, the gods look favorably on the city and thereby enable um, Rome to function. Now, now, now if, you, if you think this has gone away, ask a pastor who deals with people who haven't all gone to university. Because regularly we'll have people come into church and, you know, maybe drop a, an F-bomb and say, oh, I'm sorry, pastor. Well, why? Well, they'll, they'll drop it in the street, but once they enter into the door of the church, they won't drop it. Why? Because they have a sense of this cosmos. And if you think that this has passed away, you just haven't spent enough time with different kinds of people. Now, the problem with all these religiones, of course, is the sheer effort of keeping track of them. And it's a kind of similar thing that it, it, in Athens, it was there was a guy who was was sponsored by uh, by by the demos by the city to work out to go through all the records and to work out um, all the sacrifices that were necessary to keep the city ticking along on an even keel. Now, now, one might say comparable to this is someone who is tasked by the scientific community to find out all of the sources of carbon that are contributing to the higher levels of carbon in the atmosphere. And so you begin to discover, oh my goodness, cow flatulation, the creation of concrete, automobiles, uh, methane, volcanoes, on and on and on and on and on and on. They're doing this with respect to the gods. And so this guy went off and he went through all the records and he tossed it up. And he realized that actually, if they practiced all the sacrifices that tradition dictated that they should, the city would be absolutely bankrupt. So he, the, the, his findings were kind of buried, and they just carried on with the sacrifices that um, that they already had. And so there's a similar sense of anxiety in um, in uh, a sort a sort of pragmatism. Uh, the, the sacrificial level is good enough uh, in, in Rome as well, and this became all the more pressing in the third century AD when Roman prosperity started to crumble. Um, the city, uh, the city celebrated its thousandth birthday, and there were lots of kind of nervous thoughts. Well, you know, we've lasted this long, but blimey, things are really going badly. We've got Persians invading in the east. We've got Goths and all kinds of hideous barbarians uh, crossing the Rhine. Uh, we've got emperors who who can't seem to stay on the uh, stay on their throne for, for, for more than a week. Endless civil wars, endless assassinations. 
clearly the heavens are cross. Clearly we're, we're messing up our religiones here. And so one of the trends across the third century AD <coughs> is that emperors start to think, well, we really ought to try and rationalize all these religiones. They're clearly we ought to rationalize these religiones. Well, what does that mean? That means we're, we're going to try to have our inputs and our outcomes. We're going to try and manage those. We're going to do some A-B testing and sort of figure out some relevance realization in the heavenlies to figure out, okay, which, which God is really going to deliver for us the outcomes that we desire? Now, if you go back to the video that I'm publishing right before this, there's a meta there's a meta divine realm and find out which god is in ascendance within that meta divine realm and find out exactly the levers we need to pull this is now what we've sort of done is switched while well, we're taking out all the personalities but the meta divine realm is now the physical universe and now we're going to work these two but what's the same in both is that there's a human being at the bottom of it whose desire is manifest and working the input-output connection. Far too many. If we only had one god that we had to establish a religio with, you know, how much more convenient would that be? It'd be so much more convenient. And this is in a sense where you see the meeting of the of the of the duality between Kaufman's metadivine realm and and monotheism where okay but what's going to happen as that monothe as because in fact Kaufman's idea is that theoretically these are in two different worlds but how they're going to play out in history with fuzzy-minded human beings who who you know didn't have the framework of metadivine realm versus monotheism you know there's this is gonna be messy and so throughout the third century, a, a, a succession of emperors audition various gods for the role. So perhaps Serapis, um, so Caracalla, um, an unbelievably thuggish emperor, um, born uh, heir of, 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 of an African father, um, claimed emperor of Britain, uh, wore a, a Gallic hoodie, so that's Caracalla. Um, he was an Antonius, so he's kind of Tony the Hood. A uh, really horrible emperor. And he goes to Alexandria, and essentially he's establishing Serapis, great god there, as, 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 the, um, as, as, as the sole god. And when the Alexandrians get cross about this, he reacts in a perfectly uh, relaxed and um, temperate way by slaughtering thousands of them. Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, a few months later, while invading Persia, he went off for a pee and got assassinated. Okay. Clearly, he got the wrong relief. And then there are others. So Constantine, a century after Caracal, at the beginning of the fourth century, he auditions uh, Apollo, he auditions Heracles, he auditions Sol Invictus, the unconquered son. If all of these might be the one god. And then, of course, he's fighting a civil war by the Milvian Bridge, crossing over into Rome. And before he fights the battle, he has a vision of the cross, or so it is said, and he's told that if he fights under this sign, then Christ will bless him and will bless the empire. And he's doing science. Constantine fights under the sign of the cross, he wins the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, and so he decides that he's going to pin his fortunes to this new god, a god who, of course, had been uh, an object of much suspicion in the 300 years um, since the emergence of Christianity. Christianity. Now, now, it's interesting because what do, you, what do you mean he's doing science? And we would say, well, what's the science of Constantine winning the battle? And, well, we don't have access to that level of detail. But, but let's, what, 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 what's the science of the United States winning the war in Iraq in 2003? Did the U.S. win the war in Iraq in 2003? Well, it depends on what you mean by winning. Well, did they kick out Saddam Hussein? Yeah, that was only about two weeks. So did we win? Well, what happens right now in Iraq and Iran seems to have everything to do with winning, and how do we judge? So you take this enormously complex thing, and you have to somehow con 
construct a story around it that applies to the relevant aspects to it. Now, one might argue, given the relative success of Constantine over many of his rivals, you would say, wow, Christianity, him picking Christianity, the god of Christianity over Serapis, had nothing to do with it. How do you know? Now, Constantine doesn't really have a strong sense of what he's letting himself into. But by the end of the reign, he has come to understand that the Christian God is really a God unlike any other. Because all the other gods, the emperor is kind of in charge. The emperor is the Pontifex Maximus. He's the high priest. He's the guy whose role in the state is structured around the notion that he has the responsibility to mediate between the Roman people and the dimension of the divine. The meta-divine realm. But this is not the case with the church. The church already exists. The church has emerged over 300 years and has an identity that is quite distinct and indeed, in a sense, antagonistic to the Roman state. There is a strong sense in the Christian church that the Roman Empire, the empire that had crucified Jesus, that had persecuted um, the saints, that had inflicted martyrdoms on it, that was enshrined in the book of Revelation as the whore of Babylon, that this empire, in a sense, was distinct and inferior to the church, that the church was something aside from it. And this, for Roman emperors, was, was, was something unsettling. Now, they, they come to live with it because what the church offers, a kind of vast welfare state uh, and a source of authority and power that, over the course of the succeeding centuries, will enable the Roman Empire to survive a, a large number of dislocations and shocks. What, what that means is that, that the concept of religio starts to mutate. <clears throat> so there is now... Okay. Before he goes into the religio, what, what you see is that, in fact, let's put it in Brett Weinstein's terms, the church and everything that it brought to the conversation over and against all of the various pagan systems that everyone was doing their A-B testing for, trying out Apollo, trying out Serapis, trying out all the different gods, that somehow what happens with the church is 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 more successful. Now, Now this isn't a switch. This isn't obvious to anyone. It takes hundreds of years to unfold, but it's somehow more successful by virtue of its values, by virtue of its structure, by virtue of its religio, of its practices, of all of these things, is more successful than all the other competitors. And again, it takes hundreds of years for this thing to work its way through. It conquers. But it doesn't conquer just because of the sword of Constantine, because you have emperor after emperor with weeks and months and years, one after another, and somehow Constantine, via this choice, lasts. Was the choice incidental? Was the God incidental? Was the stories connected to the God incidental in terms of the outcomes that it manifest? Not only the one religion, because there is only the one God. <coughs> but that notion of of religio, the, 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 the notion of there being sacrifices, priesthoods, holy days, going back to the time of Romulus, this goes, this fades. And what happens instead is that the responsibility for religio, the responsibility for maintaining a kind of communion with the divine, settles on a very different order of people. And those people are people who have consecrated their entire lives to God. Now, you might say that these ancient pagan priests had consecrated their lives to gods, but the form, the shape, the religio of the consecration of the Christians was fundamentally different because of the difference in the master that they had, who, of course, was... Sunday school answer, Jesus, and the shape of his story and the shape of his assertions about the world. And they are, I said they are, they are monks, they are hermits, they are nuns. 
These are people who consecrate their virginity to God. They consecrate what they, they eat barely anything. They mortify the flesh. They suffer intensely for God. And this is not exactly Sam Harris's idea of well-being even though he limits himself to one wife. What it is to, 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 to be, um, to have religio, you, you, it, it has translated from the dimension of the public sphere, the Roman sphere of the state, and become something that is distinct and separate from it. Now, over the course of the Middle Ages, so The, the process by which um, in the West, in the Latin West, Roman power implodes and fades and ebbs away. And what is left of that structure that Constantine would have recognized is the church. And the shock troops of that structure continue to be the monks, continue to be the nuns, the, nuns, the hermits, those who consecrate themselves to God. And so this for people in the Middle Ages, as the peoples of Europe are converted and then trained in the practice of, of the Christian faith. These are the religiones. These are the people who have religio. And these are people whose gaze is fixed on the dimension of the other world, of, of, the, dion, of, of, of the eternal, um, of the, the dimension of the divine. And against them is counterpointed the dimension of what is called the cyclum. Again, the cyclum is a, is a Latin word that derives from the pagan age. And a cyclum is the span of a human life, or rather of human memory. And so every cyclum, uh, a celebration is held to, to celebrate the birth of Rome. And it's generally felt that this could be 80 years, 100 years, 120 years. Now, ultimately, it comes to kind of be settled on 100 years. So, 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 so century derives from cyclone. But what you have in the idea of the cyclone is that um, stuff gets forgotten. So you as a child might speak to your great-grandfather, and you might hear his memories, and then you will have them, but then you will die, and those memories will go forever. So to inhabit the dimension of the cyclum is to... So now if we go back to Brett Weinstein talking about what it means for a human being to come into the world, those parents have this basically a cyclum of knowledge that they're practicing and doing, and it's not just what they're telling, it's all of this stuff. And, and then what religio offers is a far longer information into the life of this generation. To inhabit a dimension in which things are swept away like kind of leaves on a, on a street. Psalmist would say chaff. And so you have in this counterpointing of, of religio sphere where people's minds are focused on the eternal or the divine, counterpointed to the cyclum, the dimension where things, you know, just turn around every year, there's kind of harvests and reaping and planting and so and so it goes on and on and on and this is the cycle of the cycle. And so throughout the Middle Ages you have this idea of there being these two rival domains. And in the high Middle Ages, the age of, 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 the, of the, the, the imperial papacy, where popes lay claim to a power over the entire world. So over the course of the Middle Ages, you get this sense of religio and cyclum as being distinct spheres. And this is something very radical and novel. It's not something that had existed in classical antiquity. It's not something that the Jews, who are... In a sense, in the Middle Ages, you have an axial age mythology of sorts, a separation as opposed to Kinyus Cosmos, even though, of course, yes, jump in there and say, well, the axial age is, is, is before Christ, that's right. But again, you have a dualism between the secular and the religious that is developing. And the secular is the now. 
and the religious is the always. Really, the only minority in Latin Christendom. They didn't really have an understanding of it. In the Islamic world, there isn't really anything comparable to this division between the spheres of religio and secular. It's very, very distinctive to, to Latin Christendom. And then in the 16th century, with the Reformation, it becomes even more distinctive. Because what the Reformation does is to put a premium on the individual and his or her relationship with God. So now, that's exactly right. But what is also right, via Charles Taylor, is that it is the invasion of the secular by the religious. You go from a two-speed system, Charles Taylor, to a one-speed system. Instead of having the monastery and the village, the religio, the religio and the seculum, what, say, John Calvin wants to do in Geneva is make the whole city religi religio. Same thing with the Puritans. Same thing with the creation of New Haven, Connecticut, in the conversation that I had. All of this is happening in the Reformation. So the monasteries, you know, no more monasteries. Now, actually, the family will be the religio. So rather than relying on a church, rather than relying on monasteries, rather than relying on nunneries or the wandering friars or the hermits for the mediation, Instead, what the Reformation does is to say there is a personal relationship between you as a believer and God. And so, again, the understanding of religio starts to mutate and change. And by the 17th century, in England, you're starting to see these two kind of opposed senses of what religion can mean that I talked about at the beginning of the talk. So you have... Um, first of all, this idea that, um, that, 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 that a religio, religion as we start to call it now, is, is a proper way of organizing a nation's understanding of God. So in the reign of Charles I, the civil wars, at stake really is our, our arguments about what God wants. One nation. This is all the way to the Cold War. One nation under God, indivisible. In God we trust on the coins. Because it is assumed that if England does not have the correct religio, the correct religion, then God will be angry. And that's, you know, that's something that goes back to, back, back to Rome. And you can hear that language coming out of churches today. And in fact, this is, this is very much Augustine in the city of God, you know, everyone is charging the Christians, well, in a sense, the barbarians were Christians who came and sacked Rome. Well, it's because you've, 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 not, you've not completed and offered the sacrifices in the temple. That's a far cry from the people of the nation have not, con have not consecrated their hearts, which you can find evidence to in the Old Testament. If my people will... Then I will look at Isaiah 58. Away. Um, but the anxiety is the same. That if we, if we, if 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 the correct religion is not being practiced, then then God will be angry. So, so Charles I says, "For such heights of evil." Uh, sorry, no, he doesn't. That's where I'm um, <laughs> the only firm foundation of all power that cast loose or depraved, no government can be stable. And of course, Charles I um, uh, discovers the hard one. Charles the first. <laughs> but if you don't have, uh, you know, if you don't have a consensus on religion, then uh, all sorts of awful things can happen. Perhaps including having your head chopped off. But at the same time, you also have because it, among the the, the, the the hotter Protestants, the devouter Protestants, the Protestants that end up kind of winning the civil war. This sense that religion is about your personal relationship with God, and so under Cromwell such as the premium that is set on the personal relationship to God, that Cromwell allows a broad tolerance. So rather than kind of leaning on people and persecuting people who don't want to all follow the same religion, he says basically that's fine. If you just believe what you want, that's okay. Now religion becomes a voluntary aspect. It doesn't make any sense to, you know, torture a confession out of someone because that's not the kind of religion that God wants. God wants a cheerful giver. God wants this freely. 
was very different from the late Middle Ages, the context of the Protestant Reformation. And that ultimately becomes the model that will pass into the modern period. And it works because of that medieval division between religio and the secular, or to anglicize it, between the dimension of religion and the secular. And what then happens is, when, for instance, the British in the 18th and the 19th century go to, say, India, Hindustan, they arrive there. And they look around them and they say, OK, so what is the religion here? And the answer is, there isn't one. Because the religion is a holy Protestant concept, as the, the British understand it. Does that stop the British kind of imposing their concept of religion on Hindustan? No, it doesn't. They're speaking English. They make Indians learn English. And so Indians learn this word religion. And there's a kind of... Um, synergy between reformers, religious reformers in India and evangelical Protestants who come from England to try and define a mutually acceptable understanding of what religion in Hindustan might be. Now there are, you know, there are various religions in, in, uh, in India, which Islam of course is, is, is a huge one. But the main one what, what is the religion of, of the Hindus? The Hindus are the, the people of India. So British people start, British officials, colonial officials, uh, start to say, okay, well, this must be Hinduism. And then the people who, who supposedly practice this religion start to think of themselves as Hindus as well. So Hindu goes from being a description of someone who lives in Hindustan to becoming a description of someone who practices the Hindu religion. And the same thing happens with another religion invented by the British, Buddhism. Again, there was, there was no equivalent to Buddhism in any Indian language, as there was no equivalent to the word Hinduism. But because English becomes the lingua franca in the Raj. Not just the concept of religion and the secular, but of Hinduism and Buddhism becomes internalized by the elites in India. And so by the time that um, India becomes independent, the Indian leaders of the independence movement have no problem in defining the kind of government they want as secular. Now, what gets interesting here is that, so when Brett is on Twitter, he basically says, well, you know what we need to survive? And then he produces an imaginary of the path forward. That's not a lot different from the Roman pagans complaining about leaving the sacrifices, except it's now in a very Protestant mental scape which is we need everyone having a personal relationship with the world in a certain framework, and then the nation, then, now it's of course globalized, then the world will survive. It's not that different from Christians in the Bible Belt saying, you know, when George W. Bush was elected, now finally, because of the Clinton escapades in the White House with Monica Lewinsky. Now, finally, we have a man of God in the White House. Um, the senator from New York, not Schumer, but the other senator from New York said the first thing that she would do when President Trump is out of the White House is sanitize it. And I thought, boy, she's making pretty much the same argument as the Christian fundamentalists made about getting Clinton out of the White House. It's little different words, little different imaginary, little different furniture in the imaginary, but basically the same functional move. Religio is not so easily avoided. Because as in England in the is to provide a space where different religions can operate. But 
it's hard to emphasize the degree to which this is a mutation from what had existed in India before the British arrived. And so you see this kind of strange evolution from the Roman Empire channeling through medieval England, ma 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 channeling through medieval Europe, through the Reformation, and then being exported across the world so that now you have, it's not just India that is self-defined as secular, Japan does as well. Neither of these countries are Christian, but the notion of the secular is a deep Christian one. And so wherever it exists, that country to a degree has been Christianized. There's an Indian scholar who's, who, who, who has said kind of very shrewdly that Christianization happens in two ways. It happens through conversion, which is the way that most people tend to think, and it happens through secularization. Now, I, I just think we won, I, I'm aware I've actually been on far too long, but... Okay, and I've gone on far too long, too, because I've got a meet-up tonight. So our view of what is relevant to the maintenance of Rome was vastly different from the Romans who complained about it to Constantine. And in fact, this is the way in which even people who are tremendously secular are also, in the same sense, continuing to carry the water for the movements that he just described that has happened around the world. Now we have religions. And when you use the category of religions in these conversations, you're already deeply within and embedded within the Christian conversation. Now, what is a religion? Produce, fact, produce human beings in a factory. Control genetics to yield A, B, and C. Read Plato's Republic, gold, silver, and bronze. Are the ideas about these things natural or supernatural? They're all nested within this frame. Well, I am out of time, and um, yeah, I should have a nice pithy summary, but I don't. So I'll just end it right now.